I do this talk even when I go out in the world and I don't talk about yugas because yugas is not necessarily the most popular topic at the moment and you don't necessarily <laughs> want to jump into it. But nevertheless, it's such an important part of what's happening in the world right now. And the way that I present it is, is in the age of, that we're moving from an age of form to an age of energy. And this is something that's obvious from almost any level, from science itself. We can see that we have moved from a time period when 100 years ago every single object in the room was understood to be made out of hard matter. And we were looking for the ultimate little building block <coughs> to create the machine or the structure or the edifice of creation out of because we were looking for hard matter. And now, um, in, the, in our time period, we know that as we look into the chair, we find the atom, and the atom is mostly empty space and energy. Quick little fact that brings it to light is that if you blew the atom up to the size of a football field, the nucleus would be the size of a grain of salt, and the electron would be the size of something even smaller than that by quite a significant amount. So what is it? It's energy. It's like when you're whipping a basket around or propeller blades. It's motion and energy. And then when we look inside of that, the electron or the neutron, proton, trying to dive deeper, we find quarks. And quarks go into leptons and torons and some other sub-quantum particles. And eventually we get to string theory. And string theory tells us that it's actually not any matter at all but a filament of energy. And it's called a string because they don't know what else to call it, but essentially it's a vibration. That's what it is, it's a vibration. It's a, it's a frequency on a certain level, so that every single element is a, is a frequency. And so just from the realm of science alone, which is our accepted religious paradigm of the modern world, um, we have entered the age of energy. But we also see it in a lot of different areas as well. In every, in, in every field, essentially. In medicine, we're not trying to work with um, the model anymore of the body as a machine where you replace the parts and fix what's wrong. We're discovering a holistic organism that's alive and has an integrity and a life force energy. And the main thing we're trying to do is restore the flow of prana so that the body can heal itself. That's a very different model. Um, but we're also, as a culture, kind of somewhere in between. We're not necessarily all living the new paradigm. Um, any more than 100 years after the death of Copernicus, anybody knew anything about what that was saying. It took several hundred years for people to even know in a general public way what was brought forth at that time. And we're barely living into the truths of the time of Einstein. We're barely awakening as a culture to the, the, the consequences of E equals MC squared matter and energy are equivalent, let alone quantum levels or the field or the, the string theory aspects of it. So we're kind of in a, caught in that in a lot of traditions. And I want to focus in on the arts and how that has affected um, the way that most of us grew up and the kind of experiences that Jigaku mentioned that are very, very common, in fact, almost universal for people who went to public school. You know, Waldorf too, you know, but it's, it's definitely the case that there's an understanding of what art and creativity is that comes from the age of form. So I just wanted to put that bridge, the age of energy. And in the age of form, art has a role that is essentially decorative. It's, it's frosting on the cake. It's what you do when all of your budget is spent and you have $10 left and you need curtains. And it's what you do at the end of a process to decorate it. That's what the primary thing about art is in that whole age of form. And moreover, you're, you're approaching the arts as a way to um, essentially represent what, we, what is outside. So the form of the trees that we see out there is going to be represented in the drawing so that it matches. And success is attained when your tree looks like the tree, and the leaves are green and the bark is brown. And, and you get in trouble in elementary school in this model if you've made a tree that's purple, or that has a different shape, or is upside down, or has a monster on top of it. You know, it's just <laughs> It's not supposed to be other than this, this equivalency, this match of it. 
And that goes deeper, too, into a whole way of thinking, a representational mode of thought. And the representational mode of thought seeks to take what has already been presented and re-present it. It's not just representational art, because obviously there's abstract art and there's expressionism, and these are kind of movements that are breaking us free of the age of form. They're transitionary movements. But they're still working with this preconceived idea in the mind that's been impressed upon the canvas. And you're trying to cerebrally come up with this picture that you're then going to match in the form. Does that make sense? Um, and this mode of thinking, the representational mode of thinking, is kind of like the equivalent of ordinary consciousness, the way that we tend to take in the sensory world and then spit it out again. But creativity is actually completely different than that. And most of what is taught in the school has very little to do with creativity and, in fact, usually damages it. Because creativity is a mode of thinking that does not come from what has been before. It doesn't come from reference to the outside world. It doesn't seek to represent anything that has been presented before. It seeks to step into a place that is absolutely unknown and draw from what has not yet existed. And that is fundamentally, obviously, different than representational. It's very interesting. They did a study where they um, took um, certain attributes that they attributed to genius-level thinking, and they created a test that they gave to engineers um, in high-level uh, settings. I can't remember if it was NASA or something else, something like that. And then they adapted that test and gave it to uh, children, the same uh, test adapted to their language level, and they found that kindergartners are pretty much 98% genius level. <laughs> 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 and the engineers who had first taken and devised the test were like maybe 7%, you know, genius level. And what they, they, they were so stunned by this that they carried this experiment out a little further and they tracked it over time and they found that genius declines rapidly with education. <laughs> and what that genius entailed that they, you know, that the engineers at the high level institution came up with was the ability to at any point in time think divergently. That's one very primary characteristic of genius. That instead of thinking the answer is representing A equals B, multiple choice, the answer is D. This is uh, representational thought. You're going to uh, converge. You're going to arrive at the solution, the answer. The answer is going to be defined. The opposite is divergent thinking that says, well, you know, actually, there's E and there's F and there's G, and come to think of it, there's about 25,000 other possibilities for this multiple choice question. And actually, why don't we just frame the question differently? Because this arises a larger issue, and I'm going to think about it this way. And this is what genius thought does. Genius doesn't just take for granted and try to find the answer. It diverges into many possibilities. And it also is free and flexible and lucid, so it can reform the question. It can go, oh, but had you thought about this when you wrote that question? <laughs> You know, or here's another way to think about it entirely. And, and so that kind of thinking is what builds the capacity for creativity. And one thing that I feel is, is very important for us to realize in thinking about this age of form, the age of energy, and the role of creativity is that almost every aspect of our situation is the result of, of our whole world situation, the, the, the deteriorating environment, the incredible crisis that we're facing in almost every arena of life at a, at a critical threshold time on our planet, is out of time for solutions that come from the kind of thinking that this represents. In some sense, one of the aspects you might say is that it's linear, and the solutions that it looks for are ones that can be brought back to a causality that is based on 
Newtonian understanding of the universe and it's billiard balls on the table and how do we find which billiard ball to put into motion so that we can affect the billiard balls in a way that will go into the pocket. And this kind of thinking is out of time. You know, 10, 20 years ago, the World Watch Institute put out, if we make these changes, we can do, you know, we can avert these crises. And now they're like, well, we didn't make them, and now the crisis is inevitable. And so I feel that creativity is actually one of the most crucial skills, uh, capacities, awakenings that we can share and create on this planet right now because that alone can take us to the territory where we can open up to all possibilities. Because all of the multiple choice te test questions right now are pretty much on B and go moving towards F in terms of our future. <laughs> you know, like, did you do well with protecting the planet? No. <laughs> you know, so we're kind of, we're going down the tunnel on that one. But, but the people who are making a difference in the world, and that's also an emergent factor. There's crabgrass happening everywhere at once, breaking through the cement of this planet. And those people are going outside the box. They're not working necessarily inside of this way of thinking. They're thinking, well, what if we did this? What if we did something completely different? What if we made this particular connection and synergy and we brought a partnership here between certain people that would never otherwise work together? Or what if we made this profitable and opened it up and it was, you know, you know what I'm saying, these kind of solutions come from the larger way of thinking that is non-linear or translinear. And so, um, so creativity is something much bigger than we thought it was. In the past, creativity was something you were assumed to possess in order to create art. So if you were an artist, which was an elite group of people that were determined by fourth or fifth grade because they could copy well, if you were an artist, you had creativity and therefore you could create and do art. You could be artistic, right? But the absolute opposite is what's actually going on as we strip away <coughs> the, the hard matter paradigm and walk into the age of energy and vibration. And that is that creativity is a state of being that every human being is capable of intrinsically and that is cultivated and brought out miraculously, excellently, through the modalities of art. So art is actually all the, the vehicles of art, dancing, clay, collage, painting, film, movement, poetry, those are vehicles for awakening creativity. Not that you have to have a bunch of creativity and be an elite person who possesses that in order to use those vehicles. Does that make sense? It's a big, mm -hmm. it's a fundamental shift. And it's important because um, on the, besides that openness of thought and thinking, the other thing that's going to make a huge difference and does make a huge difference in creating the world that we need is passion and vibrancy and aliveness. And nothing does it like creative flow. Creative flow opens you up to the vitality of your soul. And when you're in the vitality of your soul, what does that mean? You're, you're tuned into your own font of creation inside. And, and this interesting, there's a word that um, we all know well, originality. But a lot of originality at this particular phase, age of form, and it's, it's decadent dying trajectory that's happening now, <laughs> We're going to call this the dinosaur on steroids phase. Because in the art world, just like in a lot of the outer, outer worlds, the, the, the form, age of form is clinging on. And we don't see this age of energy emerging. So originality in this phase is shock value. Like what wins the Whitney biannual uh, let's see, two years ago was, you know, um, a hula hoop with spikes in it that drew blood as she danced, and, you know, just, we won't even go any further, but, you know, whatever can be more shocking and more repulsive and more lurid and titillating and disgusting will win, because originality just means breaking the boundary. Well, this was the boundary, we're going to break that, we're going to break the next boundary, we're going to go further and further and further out there. So we're basically going to move towards the model of circumference everywhere, center nowhere.
because it's far from the center and it's moving ever to be further on the edge. Right? That's the kind of, um, what would you call it, the, the kind of unspoken creed of the modern art movement at the moment. But originality actually comes from the word origin. And so true originality is when you come from the origin. And what is the origin? The origin is the big bang that happened the moment the universe began that's still inside of you in this tiny little bindi inside your spiritual eye. The, the origin is the birth of the cosmos before uh, all time and space. The origin is the eternity before there was ever time and space, and underneath all time and space, and after all time and space. That's the origin. And so when we tap that, that is when we create truly original work. Originality does not come from breaking rules. It doesn't come from going against structures. It doesn't come from, from doing something different just because it's never been done before. That actually has nothing to do with originality. I mean, just think about that for a minute. That's our whole definition of originality. You just broke the rules, you did something different, you're so cool, you went beyond the edge. But it has nothing to do with originality. It could. It might. I mean, it might be that a person went to their source, and therefore the rules were all broken. But do you see what I'm getting at? That there's, there's a <coughs> fundamental way that we think about Art and creativity that has absolutely nothing to do with it, and in fact, is often its office opposite. It's 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 detrimental and 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 undermining of creativity. And so that's what we have to shake loose. We've all entrained and taught and been taught and got a heavy burden of what it means to even say, "I'm a creative person. I'm an artist." You know, many many courses I teach around the world. The first thing people say is, "I'm not an artist." And I, I can't be creative, but I just thought I'd come here anyway. <laughs> 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 and so many people have had experiences like you've had. They, and, and when we actually get in the work, sometimes there's moments where people correct, connect to their creativity and they start weeping again. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, God, the last time I was creative, I was four years old, I was having such a great time, and then bam, that was shut down. And you can understand why. If it were just frosting on the cake, who would care? Would it really matter that much? But it isn't. It's actually the fundamental connection to our own soul, to our spirit, to our origin. And because it's connected to our origin, it's also connected to our destiny. Because the Alpha and the Omega are one. The beginning and end of our journey are the, are the same. It's a space-time beyond space-time. And so it's, it's, it's probably the most important thing about who we are and what we're doing in the world. And so to have that shut down is excruciating. And one of the most powerful things we can do for ourselves is to awaken it, and it's a gift to help awaken it in others and to support it in each other. And so that's the thought process that I would like to just kind of launch us off with and to know that as part of what we're doing here, we're going to have to ditch a bunch of assumptions that came from this realm. One of the main assumptions that we have to ditch and not let ourselves be mesmerized by is that the product is actually what we're after. Mm -hmm. That what we're doing this creative process for is to end up with the end result that then is going to be something we can critique. I mean, look at art schools everywhere. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what you did and decide if the composition is correct and couldn't you have used a little more red? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that is just nothing mm -hmm. to do with creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big paradigm shift, mm -hmm. just like what's going on in medicine. Hopefully, 50 years from now, people will laugh at the idea of having an art critique. What a stupid idea. Like, what does that have to do with anything? To look at your product and, 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 your, and decide if the composition is good. What I noticed about art schools, and like my brother went to the San Francisco Art Institute, and like I went to some art schools in Vancouver, like it's like not even about really creativity. Like I noticed in the last few years, it's like how like weird is your concept? Like 
you can have like a pile of bricks with like a can and like if you have like some like crazy idea of like what that means and how it's like relates to like society like everyone's like oh wow like, right. such cool art and I don't know it's just gotten so abstract that it's like I don't even know how much like creativity is really going into it but it's true and it's gotten very cerebral also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like basically it ma what matters is that I had this like really cool idea mm -hmm. and I was going to shave a thousand and one pencils in a pile and then you know this is going to represent I mean it, I'm not putting mm -hmm. all these ideas down yeah. but it's coming from a mental idea. And the idea is basically from a spiritual perspective ego enhancing. You know like aren't I cool that I thought of something so sublime that no one else can barely understand you know they need an art critic right. to even get what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so yeah it's it's true and the other thing that happened that touched me personally is when I was in the Bay Area in the 80s I was doing art therapy with people and I had a lot of students who were in art school who were brilliantly creative who were having their creativity just crushed out of them you know, and 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 because obviously people go to art school because they feel a connection to creativity. So it is it is a big thing, but it's also a big thing in just ordinary people every day out on the street who never ever dream of going to art school, but simply don't think of themselves as the font of creation. And when we do get to a point where we step into that power and we awaken that energy inside of ourselves, then it doesn't. The, the, the creative modalities are there to stimulate and evoke the creative energy, or excuse me, the artistic modalities, okay? They're there to evoke the creative energy. But once you're in that font of creation, it applies to everything. It applies to your business ideas. It applies to how you speak with your classroom of children, you know? It, it takes you to a place where you're living the intuitive life because you're in direct voltage connection with the source inside. And so, just as an example, you know, you're a school teacher and, and the kids run up and they're having a, a conflict or a fight and, you know, the mind goes, oh, well, what did Sally say and why did Bobby, why did you do that? And you're trying to solve it and figure it out. If you were in an intuitive place, they ran up with that conflict, you might just take a moment and breathe into it and go, I can tell you're both tired. Would you like to have a nap? You know, <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah, you know. <laughs> Not that it's always so easy, but honestly, there's often other things going on under the surface. And if you're living an intuitive life, you're responding to that rather than the form. And the form is almost always smokescreen, you know? And if you get close to what's really happening, there's like, oh, no, pay no attention to that. Um, and so if you're able to live more intuitively and directly <coughs> with what's occurring, everything you do is going to be different. It relates to the divergent thinking, to have multiple solutions and new ways of looking. Absolutely. And that divergent thinking is um, not even written down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write it down right here. <laughs> divergent thinking is also very related to superconscious thinking. And just to put that thought form out a little bit, there's an idea, there's an understanding in yoga philosophy of the gunas. We won't go into this, but I'll just put it out because we those of us who are studying it will connect to it, rajas and sattva. And in the human consciousness, there is the subconscious, conscious, and the conscious, and the superconscious. And a big difference between uh, Indian philosophy and Eastern philosophy in general in Western psychology, or um, is this uh, is that Western psychology has pretty much dealt with that and unconscious. This would be the, the Western psychology model, and Eastern thought has dealt with this, and there's no such thing as unconscious. Everything's conscious, but the. Part of us that actually sort of resides more towards the back of the brain and the reptilian brainstem that re reacts habitually is also working on the past. It's the part that has down what we already did and what we already said and how it's been done by my grandfather and how it was done by the lizards that came before me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like coming from what came before. Mm -hmm. And the conscious mind reiterates. Um, strategies and plans. 
So it can think of the, these elaborate art projects, and it also, on a daily life basis, tries to figure it all out. Like, well, if I can do that, and then I get this, and if I get this in order, and then that happens, and then I can, and then I can do that. And it's trying to solve it all rationally. It's the linear thinking that's trying to come up with the answer that will deliver me to where I need to be, or on a personal life level, when we have every duck in a row, and we have all of our stuff together, then we will emerge. And that's the conscious mind. Well, the superconscious mind is all, almost always in this place of divergent thinking. It's coming from any and all possibilities. So when a problem comes, the unconscious, or excuse me, the subconscious is going to go, oh, it's so overwhelming. Oh my God, I just can't even, like, how am I supposed to deal with that? I'm going to, like, go have a cigarette. <laughs> or, you know, I'm going to go watch a television show. Or I'm, gonna, I'm just going to basically have all of those strategies to, to get out of it. I'm, and there's many different strategies, right? I'm going to put some fog in the room and no one will even know what I'm talking about anymore. Or I'm going to, you know, we're going to deal with it by avoiding it or making it go away. And the conscious mind, being rajasic, is quite eager to jump in and solve it. It has lots of energy. You know, it's like, oh, I can solve that. Wait, let me think. <laughs> it goes into like hyper mind mode, you know, and, and I know we'll create a committee. We'll do a research project on that. We'll get all the funding. And Lori and I come run into this all the time. They finally get some money for some arts program and they're gonna spend 90% of it on a research to discover if art actually affects anything. <laughs> and this, because the conscious mind is just going to run like a hamster in a wheel trying to figure it out and it never actually arrives usually at a solution um, but the superconscious mind takes the same situation and, and it doesn't deny the problem it's like oh yeah there, there it is but you know we could do it this way or we could do it that way or come to think of it we could do it a completely different way and it's willing to, in the moment, channel an unknown. And it's also willing to spend a significant amount of time in the unknown. And this is really important to the creative process. Because the rational conscious mind has no patience for the unknown. It gets agitated and its ger inner gerbil is activated to get on that wheel. I don't want to not know. I have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> And the superconscious goes, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's hold that space of complete unknowing. So that is also a huge uh, asset to everything we do on planet Earth, and particularly spiritual growth. The ability to step into a place where you do not know and to hold open a space of not knowing. Because quick solutions are often born of subconscious and conscious mind. Quick, you know what I'm saying? That doesn't mean that superconscious can come really quick too, like a lightning bolt, but you'll be able to tell the difference. You know, you'll start to tune into that in your, in your experience. And the ability to hold a space of unknowing is also very much like the ability to face death and to face the, 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 the littleness of the ego to face the annihilation of the ego. These are all related. Because it's an, it's an uncomfortable place where you know, the end of yourself as the, as, the, as the big guy is at stake. And if you can face death, then you eliminate a whole lot of, of, of knee-jerk, reactive reasons that you do what you do. Because you're not avoiding the fundamental fear. You know? So, so that's what we want to cultivate during this week, too, is that capacity to be in the unknown. And one of the things that helps that, which is um, the Pacific <coughs> Northwest is a lovely place to be because it's the home of a whole lot of what I would call new communication technologies. Mm -hmm. And some of them are things like appreciative inquiry. Does anybody know about that? Mm -hmm. and uh, open space, even things like uh, nonviolent communication. Oh, what else? What are some others? Full sign. How do you spell that? Um, S-O-L and then S-A-R-N. And these are ways, and there's more. Others? World Cafe. World Cafe, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the art of hosting conversation mm -hmm. is has a website with all of these uh, folks working together very exciting the art of hosting conversation so Laura you can send that to me and I can send it out to them mm -hmm. on the email mm -hmm. and what these are are ways of repatterning the way that we language and speak about what we're doing and also in our interaction with others and that opens up new territories it's amazing how much of our life is closed down by the way that we say what we say and when we speak differently, we open up new possibilities. Obviously, moving out of right and wrong into gray and multicolored, for instance. But an appreciative inquiry, for instance, starts with, well, let's look at what's right with the situation. Let's appreciate what's working. And in fact, the research shows that when you appreciate what's working, you get quicker to solutions that deal with what's not than if you look at what's not. If you look at what's not, you stay for a really long time because what's not working isn't working. <laughs> and so you join in that energy and months go by. But if even a situation is 90% dysfunctional and you look at the 10% that is, you will have faster progress addressing that situation. And appreciative inquiry goes down to just the way we talk to each other. I really appreciate how you've said that and I, I hear what you've said. So that's just a little bit of the taste and the example of it. So I want to wrap up today because I don't want to spend all the day talking, I don't have time to play, but I'd like to have time for questions and thoughts and reflections and adding input to what's been presented here. Yahoo! <laughs>